the Aussie BIM Guru. Today we're going to be covering a pretty exciting topic which has been hotly requested, which is how to uh, do, do a generative design study in Grasshopper. And we're going to be using a package today called Galapagos, which is quite well known. So generative design in Rhino 3D. So in this video, we'll just briefly cover what generative design is, how you can build a script in Rhino and set up a study, run it, and then just my thoughts on how it is to do generative design in Rhino. So the files will be available on GitHub if you need them. Um, so the reason I've been doing these studies, uh, I have used Galapagos before in the past, um, but I'm using it now because there's a new generative design tool that Revit's released. So I thought it would be great to do a comparison between the two and show how the two tools work and then just compare them. So I'm going to be using Rhino inside. So I'm actually going to be running Rhino inside Revit and I'm going to be using Grasshopper inside Revit. So essentially this is an actual Revit based study. So it's very comparable to the generative design tool on a fair basis. Um, you can actually find some videos on Rhino Inside on YouTube. If you look for the videos with these two thumbnails, or these two icons in the thumbnail, there's a five part series I've put together. So there's actually a lot of 3D solvers for generative design in Rhino. There's a great article by Proving Grounds, um, which discusses some of them here. So definitely check this out. If you're not aware of all the options, um, some really common ones that people use are a possum, Octopus and Wallasai, um, especially Wallasai, that seems to be quite popular. But there's other ones as well that you can see the icons for here. But in this case, we're just going to be looking at Galapagos. So this actually comes inbuilt with Rhino 6, and I believe it may have been inbuilt into some previous versions as well. And we're really just going to be using these two nodes here today. These are great, um, so they, they're really easy to use, and I'll show you how you can set up a generative design study for, a, in this case, a feasibility view analysis. So as we probably know about Galapagos turtles, um, Charles Darwin actually studied these when he was looking at the concept of evolution. And he was quite interested by the variations that he saw in their, in their genes or their genome. Um, for example, you can see here that certain types evolved in different ways. Um, so Galapagos is sort of inspired by this and it's an evolutionary solver, essentially. It's a different class of generative design solving. So the general principle, is we randomize some inputs. In the case of Galapagos, we call these genes in a gene pool. And then we keep rerunning our study using an algorithm. And we set goals that we measure. So we measure the fitness of our solution. The difference in evolutionary solving is that we send and inherit our genes back to the gene pool. So over time, we're gonna get closer and closer to the optimal result or one of the optimal results in our study. So we're gonna keep improving the quality of the genes, which leads to this concept of evolution. So I like to see it a little bit like this as a Nintendo fan. So as we get further and further in, our design gets stronger and more optimal, just like we'd raise a Pokemon. <laughs> so as a demonstration, we're actually gonna run Rhino inside Revit, and we're gonna take some geometry out of Revit. This is actually the geometry we've used in a generative design study in Revit before. So we can pretty fairly compare them, and then we'll set up the study and show you how it works. Um, so I'm just going to jump into Revit. In my case, I'm in Revit 2020, or 2020.2.1. And I've actually got Rhino inside booted up. So I've installed this, and I've got a license of Rhino 6 to support it. Um, in this case, what I'll do is just launch Rhino. So I've got Rhino and Grasshopper, and these are inside Revit. Um, so what I'm going to do is just start off by collecting uh, some inputs from uh, Revit using Rhino inside. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to get a Revit graphical element. So in this case, I'm, actually what I might do first is just put on my bifocals so you can see the names of everything as I go. Perfect. So I'm going to right click and just go set one Revit graphical element. So I'm going to go into floor plan so that I can actually go and obtain my property line. So I'll click once and I should get my property line and I'm going to get my element geometry using Rhino inside. So I'm going to go get element geometry. And we should get our property lines as four curves in this case. And I'm just going to join those four curves. So I'm going to use join curves and just make it one curve. And we can use this to generate the outline of our study. So this is pretty much the first little piece of our study. So I'm just going to group this off just so we can keep things clean. And what we might do now is just generate um, some values for our study. 
So what we need now is a gene pool using Galapagos. So under the parameters tab, under utility, we're just gonna get a gene pool. So this is essentially just a whole bunch of values that we can feed into a Galapagos study and they're always between a certain range. You can also randomize them too. So I can right click and I can just randomize them by a certain percent, maybe just a, a fraction of 1% or 10%. And this sort of reflects the way Galapagos works. As your study keeps running, you'll vary certain aspects of the study less and less. So based on the fitness of your genes. So eventually we will breed out the bad solutions and only get the good ones. So we're gonna right click and just go to edit in this case, because we do wanna change some of these things. We'll work between zero to 100, um, because this is an easy domain to work with, because it's essentially just a percentage of a value. So we can multiply this by other numbers to obtain different ranges. In this case, we just need a few genes. We only need three. And we'll just go to, in this case, four decimals. So now we have three sliders that we can randomize. So I'll just get them pretty random. So in this case, we need to obtain each gene separately. So we're gonna use a list item node in order to do this, just to call on specific list items. So we've got index zero, we're gonna make index one. In this case, I'll just internalize the value of one and we'll get index two. Whoops. In this case, I'll internalize the value of two. Well, I keep doing something there. There we go. So we essentially now have three numbers that we can work with. So the topmost line is in this case gonna be the size of our building. So we do need to work in a specific range or domain of building size. In this case, let's work between 15,000 and 50,000. So we're gonna write a panel and we're just gonna write 20,000 to 50,000. And two is essentially the way that we can just imply a domain. So a lower and upper value. And we're gonna remap these numbers. So in this case, we're gonna remap our value. And we could, mm, we don't have to remap, I guess. Um, yeah, we'll do a remap anyway. And we'll just write out our current domain as well as our target, uh, as our target domain. So our value is what's coming out of here. Our domain that we're currently working with is zero to 100 and our target domain is 20 to 50,000. So what we'll end up with is the remapped equivalent number for the percentage along that gene. So in this case, now we have a number that we can work with. We're gonna divide this by two because we need to offset our site boundary by half of this value. So we're just gonna set this. Oh man, it's really struggling today with this. Two, wow, it's, yeah, it's been really jumpy today. There we go. I do find that sometimes the user interface in Grasshopper can be a little bit, a little bit finicky, um, but that's all right. And what we need to do now is divide these two values by 100. The reason we're doing this is because we need to make these a UV parameter between zero and one. So we're gonna remap our domain just by dividing it by 100. In this case, I'm just going to divide by 100 and I'm gonna make another one and I'm gonna divide this by 100. So we have a U and a V parameter. From here, I can construct a UV as a point. So I'll go X, Y, and I'll just turn off my preview. And at this point, we have some values that we can proceed with. I'll just move this up here a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is just group these together. Cause this is essentially our values that Galapagos is gonna shuffle around for us now to inform our study. So we're gonna do a few things. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna offset our site boundary. So we're gonna get an offset curve. We're gonna take our site boundary. And I might just go over to Rhino at this point. So you can see what Grasshopper is doing to Rhino. And in this case, we're gonna be offsetting by half of the site boundary. So in this case, if we make our building a little bit smaller, you can see we offset less. So in this case, let's just make it a little bit smaller. So now when we place a building on the edge of our site, it will never go past the boundary of our site. It will always at least be butt faced to the edge of the site. Um, so in this case, we can get a compliance study. You could obviously add a number to this offset if you needed to have an inset beyond that as well. We're just gonna turn this into a surface. Um, so for anyone that's seen my generative design video, we're following very similar steps um, to the workflow. There'll be a few changes, but it's a very similar workflow. What we're gonna do is evaluate our surface at that UV point. So we're gonna take our surface, we're gonna take our UV, and we do need to right click and reparameterize. In this case, we need to reparameterize our surface. This way we're always working in the domain of U and V from zero to one. 
And we can see now that as we change our UV sliders, we go to a different position on our site. So at this point, we have a position to place our building, which is great. What we'll do now is we might just do a custom preview and just override the color of some of these elements. So in this case, let's take our boundary and we'll just get a swatch, a color swatch. And I'll just, in this case, make a red swatch. Just so our results are a little bit easier to understand. Okay, so I might just go and just turn the preview off for all these elements and also my surface. So now I have just a red outline for my site. Much easier to see what's going on. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is we're gonna generate a rectangle to the size of our building. So we're gonna make a rectangle and we'll just make it based on the standard rectangle node. In this case, our point is gonna be where we've started from. Our X and our Y value, in this case, are gonna to have to be, hmm, they're gonna to have to be based on a certain size. So in this case, we're going to have to create domains. So we're going to construct a domain because the rectangle node works in a domain from a negative to a positive value or just from a value to a value. So we're telling the four corners where they belong. In this case, we're taking our values. And in this case, we need to apply an expression to one of these. So we do need to make one of these negative. So we're going to make multiply by negative one. So we're going to make this actually x times negative one. So multiply the input by negative one. Now, if we add these as the mains, we'll generate a rectangle in both directions, which is driven entirely by the size of our building. So we can see that now there's a relationship between those two elements. So at this point, we'll just take that rectangle and we do need to offset this by a particular height. So we're just gonna set up an algorithm to determine the height of our building. So in this case, I'm just gonna make a multiplication node. I'm going to take this value and I'm just going to, I'm going to multiply it by itself to find out the, the, the area of the floor plate of my building. I'm then going to divide it, in this case, by a particular target. So let's just divide this value into meters. So in this case, I need to divide it by this value. And now we should get the square meters of that floor plate, which seems correct because we've got at the moment yeah, about 30 meters by 30 meters and as a result we end up with about 900 square meters so that seems correct at this point we just need to set a control so we're going to divide that number again by just a control number and in this case i believe uh i'm just trying to see how much i've done it by so it's five three 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 okay so i think in this case i've done it by five million in this case so i've, I've converted it down by a factor of 50 and I'm also converting it down by, uh, in this case, I need to actually divide this by the number. And then I should end up with my height control in this case, I believe. Um, yeah, it looks like it's not quite right. I think in this case, this is probably the height we're targeting instead. No, that's not quite right. I'm just quickly gonna check the height relationship I've set up. I might need to add an extra zero here, actually, I think. Yeah, that looks right. So now we've got about 50 meters when we've got a 30 square meter building. So if we have a very, a very small building, we should have a larger height. So when we've got a smaller, yeah, we've got about a 90 meter building now. So this is roughly what we want. So we've set a limit or a threshold that controls the proportion of our building. Um, so in this case, we'll just script this off as a little part of our script because it does its own thing. We're also going to group this part off as well because it, it does its own thing. Okay, so now we have a height. So we need to extrude our rectangle. So we're gonna use the extrude node. In this case, we need to extrude the rectangle and we need to extrude it in the Z direction. So up by this number. And now we have a volume for our building. We also need to cap the holes because currently it's just open at the top and the bottom. Perfect. So we can just turn off our rectangle. And now we have a volume for our building. And again, we'll just get a color swatch and give it a preview. So we'll make this a particular color. In this case, I'll just take the geometry and let's just make it a green in this case. We'll make it just a little bit less extreme. Cool, so now we've got a custom preview. And I might just save this script before it crashes on me. <laughs> okay, so now we've custom previewed this. So what we need to do next is we need to find all the points that we want to generate our views from 
is we're going to be testing the view aspect of our building and measuring it. So in this case, I'm going to be dividing my height by a floor to floor height. So in this case, I'm going to divide my height. And in this case, I'm going to generate just a 3,500 millimeter floor to floor. And after this, we're just going to round this so that we can find the number of elements as a floor because we obviously can't fit a floor that's not complete. So we're going to get the amount of successful number of floors we have, which is 25. In this case, I'm just going to multiply my floor to floor by that to find out the height of my total number of floors that I've generated. So this is my successful height. This is, this is my potential height. And what I'm going to do with that is just build a domain. Whoops, so I'm just going to build a construct domain. And I'm going to be taking in this case, that value. And I'm just going to be going up from zero in this case. So in this case, it's zero to the top of that successful height. What I can do with this then is just build a range. So by the number of floors, that I can get to that height. And what I should get is a list of elements that we can offset our point by. So I'm gonna turn this into a Z vector or a range of Z vectors. I'm just gonna group this off because it's its own little piece of the script. And what I'll do now is I'm gonna to have to move my point. So I'm gonna move my test point. So I might just turn off this preview so I can see what I'm doing. So I'm gonna take this point back here that we generated from our surface and I'm going to offset it. Now we have test points we can measure our rays from. And we're going to move on with these um, for the next part of our script. So in this case, we actually need to generate a range of vectors to generate our rays from. So what I'm going to do is just build a range and I'm just going to build a domain from zero to 350. And in this case, I want to generate 35 rays we're going to generate a ray every 10 degrees out from there. And we're going to rotate, in this case, our vector. And we're going to rotate an object. In this case, I believe we'll do it around an axis, yes. So in this case, we're going to take our angle. We're going to take our vector, which in this case is the y-axis. And we're going to rotate it around the z-axis. So we should, up, should end up with a vector in all 36 directions. I'm then going to generate a line by SDL or start direction length. So I'm going to start from my points. I'm going to work in the direction of my vectors and I'm just going to make it pretty long. Let's make it just pretty long. Okay, so in this case, it doesn't quite work. Our mapping's not working the way we desire it to. We're generating one, one ray per point that it finds as it goes around that circle. So what we actually want to do in this case is we want to graft. So now we get every vector for each point. So now we can see that we've generated a lot of view rays. So that's pretty cool, right? We can also generate more of them if we want to. We can really densify our, our study. In my case, I'm just gonna do 35 though. Okay, because that's how we measured our original study in the geometric, in, in the um, generative design tool as well. What I need to do now is collect my site geometry so that I can intersect it with these rays at each level. So I'm gonna get another graphical element node on the Revit graphical element. And I'm just gonna move this to the sides and I'm just gonna go set one and I'm just gonna pick my site geometry. From this, I'm just gonna go to Revit element and I'm gonna go to element geometry. With this geometry, I'm gonna convert it to mesh because I'm gonna run a mesh intersection, which is much faster. So now I can go back into Rhino. I'm just gonna hide my rays for now. And we'll see now we have the mesh. And obviously it looks pretty ugly, but it does the job, to be honest. Um, and with this, we can just join it all together. So the great thing about meshes is you can join them even if they're not touching. B reps, you can't do that. So that's why we're using mesh as well. So now we just have a single mesh for our entire site. What I might do as well is just use another custom preview node just to make my geometry look a bit nicer. So we're gonna just reference the element geometry from the start because we can get a much cleaner geometry appearance if we use this. So I'm just gonna take my geometry and in this case, I'll turn on my preview. And in this case, we'll just give it a, a more blue, a more blue color. What I'll do is just hide my site geometry and I'll just go back and turn on my building as well. So now we have sort of our three graphical inputs. I'll take my points and stop previewing them. So at this point we have our mesh and what we can use is we can actually intersect this. So I'll just quickly group. And as well as that, I'm also gonna group 
just keep my script a little bit organized. So we're going to use the mesh ray intersection method. So I believe this is under mathematical. Well, I've just been covering Rhino. Whoops. I think it might be under here. Um, we're looking for the mesh ray. There we go. So it's a semi-infinite ray, which is quite useful. So in this case, um, we don't actually need... Uh, actually, yeah, we, we don't necessarily need to generate line by start direction length, but we are doing this so that we know how many rays we've generated. So in this case, we're just going to take our input mesh. We're going to take our direction. So we're going to go back to our vectors instead. And for our points, we're going to go back and obtain our list of points. Now remember, we need to change our mapping, so we need to graft this result. Now you can see we're getting all the intersections between these rays. So we know how many times our rays are hitting our site. You can see that's really quick, um, very fast, uh, so very easy. In this case, we need to actually just send this through a NOT gate because we need to flip this condition because we want to find out when we have false results. So we need to make these true so that we can apply a cull pattern. So we're going to get a cull pattern. And in this case, we're going to cull our lines that we've generated. So in this case, we're only going to see the lines that successfully went through our site. So we can see we're limiting our study by what successfully didn't intersect with our geometry. This is much better. This is exactly what we want to see. So in this case, we're going to take this cull pattern and we're going to count the list length of each list. Because this will tell us how many successful results occur at each level. And we're just going to flatten our result. So what we should get now is numbers indicating the successful number of rays as they occur. And as we see we go up the building, we get more results, which makes sense, right? Okay, and we're just going to apply a mass addition function just to find the total number of successful views in our study. So nice and easy. I'll just hide this cull pattern for now. And from there, we can just generate that as a number. And the reason we're going to do that is because this is going to be our measure of fitness. So I can just generate this and I can also just get a panel and have a look at what I'm getting. So I can see at the moment, I've got 386 successful views. What I'm going to do now is go to parameter and I'm going to go back to utility and I'm going to get the Galapagos solver. Place this down. So it's a bit of a funny node. It's got a, a sideways connection as well as a backwards connection. So I'm going to connect this back to my gene pool. And now my gene pool is connected to my solver. But as well as that, I'm also going to connect my fitness. So in this case, I'm going to grab my fitness measure and I'm going to attach it to my number. So now it's going to take this result and send it back to the gene pool in order to inform further evolutions of the study. So essentially we have a Galapagos study ready to go. So it's pretty fun, it's pretty cool. Um, I'll show you what it looks like when you run it. So if you double click on this component, we're now in Galapagos, or the i8 bugs for breakfast blog, that's pretty cool. We can check how we're actually measuring our study here. So what's our fitness method? Are we minimizing or maximizing? In this case, we're trying to maximize the number of views. So you could work on a minimized blocked view aspect as well, if you wanted to. You can set limits for how long it runs for. You can also set evolutionary solving criteria. So for example, how, how much do your results interbreed? Do, do they work within the same genome pools or do they work between gene pools that it generates? Um, but this is all quite complicated for someone that doesn't understand what's going on. So you can just ignore it and go to the solver. So this is the, the Galapagos solver. So in this case, we're gonna be working with the evolutionary solver, but you can work with an annealing solver as well. I typically just work with the evolutionary solver because it makes the most sense. Let's have a look at every single genome in the Rhino viewport. Now it's gonna generate them very fast. So it, it's pretty cool. But pretty much what we can do now is just start solving. So as soon as I click this, um, things are gonna get pretty crazy. So watch, watch this. Bang. <laughs> now look how fast that is. Look how many results I'm testing. And as, as it moves through, look that it's sort of optimizing itself. Notice that our result is starting to prefer this zone on the site. It's identifying that it's getting the best views at this position on the site. And this sort of makes sense because we have really the lowest frontage around this portion of the site. So it sort of makes sense. Um, and we can see that obviously it's maximizing the height because the higher the building gets, the better the views get. We can also see that as we go in, we're getting a, a more stable line of fitness as it's being measured. And we can also have a look at the clustering of our results. So we can see that we're sort of getting a clustered result now. It knows that for the most part, it needs to pretty much be around this set of elements. So there we go. We can really see a few ways to measure this. Now we can look at the top 10%, the best results. Let's just look at some of these genomes. So I can reinstate a genome or I can reinstate another one. And what we can do now is take this 
and send it back from another, another study. So we can start from the selected genome and we can just start at that point and we can just keep refining and evolving our study until we found the optimal outcome. Now let's just rerun from scratch and see what we look, what we get. We should get something pretty similar ideally. So again, we'll, we'll let it keep going. Off it goes. Go you, good thing. Wow, it's fast. Then we can see again, we're, we're starting to end up at the same point on the site. So we're pretty getting pretty confident now that we've probably found the optimal solution for this site. And it, it's amazing how fast this works. If I just cancel this and I turn on my rays in my cold pattern, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of geometry to display, right? Well, if I go back in here and I just run Galapagos, and I look at all my genomes, look at that, look how quickly it's generating these elements. It's rapid. It's amazing how quickly this is working. Um, so, you know, this would just be impossible in Revit itself. Even with the generative design tool, we just cannot handle geometry this fast. So it's pretty amazing just what this can do. And I mean, this has been around for a very long time. And it's not even the most complex generative solver Grasshopper has. So pretty funky. So there you go. We've just generated uh, our generative study and we found our optimal position and outcome on our site. So now we can go to our client and say, we're confident that we've found the best solution for this project. So there it is. Um, so I guess my thoughts on Galapagos in general um, is that obviously the good is that it's, it's lightning fast. It is so quick. Um, you can see that I was generating thousands upon thousands of results in that study easily. It's almost too fast. <laughs> it's easy to set up and it's easy to use and run and understand. There's only a couple of components you need to use. The key is to set up your study, essentially. That's the hard part. Um, and it's a great gateway to other tools. So if you want to end up using something like Wallaceye or Opossum or Octopus, typically most of the time starting in Galapagos is a good start because it gives you an understanding of genes and solvers and evolutionary principles. So the bad, um, probably the, the one limitation that really holds it back is it only works with a single goal of fitness. Now, from what I understand, Opossum is another package that's very similar that can work with more than one goal. So definitely check that one out if you like what you see, but you need to set, check more than one goal at the same time. With the, um, the generative design tool in Revit, for example, you can measure more than one goal at the same time when you filter your results. Um, it's also fairly random in its approach. You can see that it starts purely random and then it evolves to become less random over time. So sometimes the, uh, the solver can end up with very different results depending on where it decides to test. So if you're working with uh, something that has a few different uh, greatest options, it's not always going to find the same option. It sometimes will actually find very different outcomes. And the ugly. Well, the UI, it's not very friendly for non-users. Like someone that doesn't use computational tools won't understand what they're looking at or what they're even watching. So that can lead to them getting a bit scared, especially when they see the speed of it as well. Um, when you're watching that many options working that fast, um, and you don't have to show that many options, you can show less. You can just show the best outcomes from a genome. Um, it, it can scare people a little bit because they don't understand what's happening. And that's probably one of the biggest holding backs of generative design, that the people that get have the most to benefit from it they're not the ones writing the scripts. They're the people running the companies that could make more informed decisions. So we can't scare these people away from this technology if it looks too scary. And most of the grasshopper approaches I find look a little bit too scary compared to the Revit generative design tool. Uh, but I will do a proper comparison in a future video. I'll just put them side by side and literally run them at the same time. And we'll just compare it. Maybe we'll challenge Galapagos to get a thousand solutions and we'll challenge Revit to get a thousand solutions. And we'll see how long it takes, but we'll also check how meaningful the results are that we obtain and how similar they are as well. That could be quite interesting. Maybe they end up determining quite different things about what we're looking at. So the files for this will be on GitHub, so feel free to download them if you want to follow along. Um, but hopefully you enjoyed this presentation and it taught you a little bit more about generative design and Galapagos and Grasshopper um, and gave you a, a tool for your, your designing, which I think, I think would be really helpful. Um, so thanks for watching. If you're not already following and subscribing, feel free to do so. Um, I make two videos a week and I am two for a while. And in the next video, we'll be touching on comparing this back to Revit's tool as well. Um, so I look forward to seeing you in future videos. Thanks. Take care. Bye.